Good morning. Glad uh, for everyone that's here and uh, all of our visitors, we're glad that you're with us. Thank you so much for coming and uh, joining us, worshiping God together with us this morning. Uh, all those joining us online, we have 27 devices right now uh, worshiping with us from Oklahoma, Texas, Kansas, and uh, so glad that you are with us as well. We are going to be turning your Bibles to Luke chapter 1. We are going to uh, be in Luke chapter 1 today. And we're going to read, our story today starts with an angel. And his name is Gabriel. And of all the angels mentioned in, in Scripture, only two do we know their names. We know Gabriel, his name is uh, mentioned, and Michael, the archangel. And so uh, what we know about Gabriel is, we first read about him in the book of Daniel. Gabriel appears to Daniel uh, twice to help Daniel with information once uh, about a vision and once about the future and details. And so Gabriel appears to Daniel. Then uh, later, years later, he appears to Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist. And then not, not many months after that, he appears to Mary. And so Luke chapter 1, verse 26 says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. So, Nazareth was, there's nothing uh, special about the city of Nazareth. It wasn't large, it wasn't in a prominent location. There was nothing especially noteworthy about this town. Uh, just a common Jewish town in the country, in Galilee. And Gabriel goes to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And so we read about this virgin, she's betrothed, and the word, our word for that would be engaged. She's engaged to Joseph uh, in the Jewish society and Jewish culture in the first century. <clears throat> you would get engaged, and to break that engagement, it would require a divorce. But during that engagement, you would still, you would not, the couple would not be intimate until... Uh, the wedding till the honeymoon. And so in that sense, uh, that didn't happen until the honeymoon, but the commitment began at engagement. And that's where, so this is that period of time Joseph and Mary are in. Um, our culture says, how can you know if you're compatible with someone unless you sleep with them first and even live with them first? And, and from a human standpoint, I think we can see, we can see where people would acquire or, or feel like that's logical. And that's, that is standard practice, as you know. I'm not telling, telling you anything you don't know. But did you know studies show couples who live together before marriage actually divorce at a higher rate? And many argue the, that more damage has been done to marriage intimacy from premarital sex than any postmarital incompatibility in the bedroom. Regardless, God says, wait till marriage, and that's exactly what Joseph and Mary were doing. In verse 28, the angel says, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. In verse 29, we'll see that Mary is, uh, she is freaked out. To use our language. She's, you know, this says greatly troubled. That sounds real dignified, doesn't it? Uh, she's scared out of her wits. And really, oftentimes, when people encountered an angel in Scripture, in history, when people encounter angels, they are overwhelmed with um, just fear. It, it, this is a godly presence, and they don't, and, and they, they, they don't know what to do. Uh, but fear is a common reaction. And the only time people were not afraid of an angel is when angels disguised themselves so they would not know that they're angels. But Mary's afraid. But before we get to that, look at the words that are said about her. Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. That's what we should want. If you know that you are favored and God is with you, you have it. 
What, what, what more do we want? If you're favored by God and He's with you, that should be what we want. That should be our desire. And, and the Scripture says, come near to God, He'll come near to you. And a lot of Scripture talks about walking with God. That, that's how this happens. But if Mary, just at this point, if we just stop and this is all we know, she's doing well because she's favored by God and He's with her. All right, let's read on. So she's greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. So verse 30, the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Jesus was the Greek translation of the, word, of the name Joshua. And the name Joshua means... Yahweh saves. Yahweh was that. Yahweh is the most, um, most, I, I have a hard time describing this. It, it is, we have a number of names that refer to God. Yahweh is the original or the, the most um, precise Yahweh. And we, we actually don't even really know a good pronunciation because the Jews wouldn't say it. They would reference God Almighty, but they wouldn't say that name because they were afraid to take it in vain. Joshua means Yahweh saves. And Joshua, you can imagine, was a... I used to say... Uh, so you have Joshua and then the Greek version is Jesus. I used to say that Jesus was a very common name in the first century. That's not really the, the most accurate way to say that. A more accurate way is Jesus was a very popular name. Popular. Why? Because it was the Greek version of Joshua. Why is that special? Because Joshua, the name means God saves. And to the Jewish culture, and many cultures, but to the Jewish culture, the name, what they would name their children had meaning, had literal, specific, it meant something, maybe... The closest thing that, that uh, would help us on that is if you think of Native Americans, you go back far enough, Native Americans, uh, their names meant something. It's very obvious what that name meant. And the Jews were that way. And Jesus was named Jesus because it means God saves. In fact, in Matthew, when Jesus was uh, telling this to Joseph, when the angel, excuse me, when the angel was speaking to Joseph, uh, in Matthew 1.21, the angel says, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So go back to Luke, read on in this story with the angel and Mary. The angel says, He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. Of course, Jesus comes in the lineage of David, that you trace that lineage all the way down to Jesus, and that was predicted. It was prophesied. Well, to Mary at this point, when the angel says, this child will, be, will have the throne of his father David, guess what that means? He's the Messiah. That's the Messiah. In the first century, the Jews were suffering under the oppression of the Romans, and they knew God had predicted a Messiah would come. A Messiah, what does that mean? Well, to the Jews, it meant another military leader. We are going to rise up and overthrow the Romans. So the angel says he will have the throne of his father, David. But let's read on verse 33. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom... Of his kingdom there will be no end. Now what the Jews did not understand is the kingdom that God prophesied, the, the throne of David that Jesus would reign on would be a spiritual kingdom, not a physical kingdom, not soldiers, not military plans, not conquests, a spiritual kingdom. Guess who this is? This is us. This is you. This angel says... By the way, the angel Gabriel, he makes mention to Zechariah when he tells Zechariah about John the Baptist being born. Gabriel, he says of himself, because Zechariah kind of questions him a little bit, and Gabriel says, listen, I stand in the presence of the Lord Almighty. 
We don't know much about Gabriel or his role, but he's, he's a special angel. And he comes and he says that Jesus will reign over a kingdom that will have no end. That kingdom is the church. You and I are that kingdom. 2021, all over this world, first day of the week, this kingdom is meeting to worship the Almighty. Isn't that something? This, when we gather so often, it feels so ordinary. It doesn't feel, maybe, like we're doing something so monumental or that we're a part of something all that special. We're only, it's just, I, I, we're only a part of the greatest thing on earth, the kingdom of God. Amen. It's the greatest thing, and this kingdom will never end. Guess what? In 200 years, guess what we will be doing? Same thing we're doing this morning. We'll be worshiping God, but it will be, it will be different. We will be in the presence of God. We'll worship Him. We'll praise Him. We'll love Him. We won't sleep. We won't cry. We won't hurt. That kingdom will continue. Anyway, Mary, no doubt, had very little understanding of what this would be. But look at verse 34. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I'm a virgin? So Mary asks a good question. But it's an odd question because she's questioning an angel. How's God going to be able to pull this off? And, you know, I remember when my girls, when our girls were little, like all kids, they would come, you know, periodically a toy would break. And I remember there'd be times, a, a, you know, one of our girls might have a, a Barbie doll and the arm came off or something. And, and it, she'd bring it to me, you know, in tears. Her, her doll broke. She had that look on her face and. She doesn't know what to do. It's not like she came and said, hey, will you fix this for me? No, she's distraught because this is broken. What am I going to do? And she'd hand it to me, but I could see in her face she didn't know, especially the first time. Can Dad fix this? What can Dad do? It's broke. And, of course, I'd pop the arm back in the socket, hand it back to her. She's amazed. Right? Amazed. Isn't that what we do? Mary is asking the creator of the universe who spoke and a universe came into existence so massive we can't even see the end of it. There probably is no end, but we can't see the end of it. We can't even see it. And Mary's asking the one who spoke into creation... How are you going to do this? He, he picked up dirt and made a person. And Mary's saying, but how will you do, how will I have a baby, how will, how will you be able to do this? And the angel answered and said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Think about this. This birth of Jesus had never happened before. This conception of a virgin, never before and never since. A woman, had, a woman who had never been with a man having a child. Through a normal pregnancy. You understand what I'm saying? And this has not happened. And it still hasn't happened. Only one time did it happen. And people believed Mary about it. And Joseph, an angel appeared to Joseph. And Joseph believed. And no doubt Elizabeth, her cousin, believed. And Zechariah, the husband, believed. And others, some, surely believed Mary. But guess, you think most people believed her? So, but others did. Some believed that this happened, but there was only one who knew it happened. And I think, according to Scripture, Joseph, he understood and he believed that Mary had not been with another man, but only Mary knew. There was only one that knew, absolutely, that this happened. And that was Mary. The first recorded miracle of Jesus, you may remember, is when he turned water to wine, 
But the first miracle involving Jesus is this conception. And it happens to a poor, humble, common Jewish virgin in a common Jewish town of Nazareth. But it's holy. The Holy Spirit did it. Everything about Jesus would be holy. So verse 36, Behold, your, we- your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. <laughs> the angel says, hey, guess what? God's not just doing, God's got other tricks up his sleeve. I mean, God can do a lot of things. He, not only is he going to bring Jesus about a child uh, with you a virgin, but he, listen, he's also, Elizabeth, she was past the age of childbearing years, and she has conceived through God's power. And, in, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing is impossible with God. Angel takes a moment to make a point here with Mary. Hey, don't doubt God. Don't doubt God. Nothing is impossible with God. The the message here is from God. God said, hey, the impossible is what I do. The impossible is my specialty. That's what I do. When you, uh, I remember us bringing our, our girls, each one, of course, uh, home from the hospital. When you bring a baby home from the hospital, a newborn, it's exciting, but it's also nerve-wracking because you have this very fragile human being that requires some fragile care. You bring a baby home from the hospital, and I remember kind of early on with our girls during those times, uh, you know, who's watching the baby? Some of someone had the two people can be watching the baby. One person can be watching the baby, but two people can't be doing something in another room and no one watching the baby. Somebody has to be watching. And and now we're going through it again with our grandson Noah. And he's uh, as soon as he started walking, of course, he's very active. And there's always something else to get his attention somewhere. His attention is not not very long, is it? And so he's, <laughs> Ruthann knows, and uh, so no, he's, he's here and there and everywhere, and so someone is on point with him, at least one person. And uh, so, so commonly when we, you know, when he's around, a question will be, even in this building, after services, he may be running around, and, who has Noah? That's a good question. Who has Noah? Somebody has to have him. Sometimes uh, Abby will have Noah, and uh, she's 16, which to some of you is very old and mature, right? Rightfully so. But to a 51-year-old dad, 16 somehow got young. Anyway, so I worry sometimes, okay, Abby has him. Okay, well, I still worry a little bit. Maybe I'll go check. Let me ask you this question. Who has you? you we think when we become grown or adulthood when you reach the age of adulthood you can handle yourself we can't handle ourselves we cannot take care of ourselves if so why do we worry so much do americans worry less than people in third world countries no so having more prosperity doesn't solve the worry problem we still worry do you worry about anything in your future? Anyone worried about their future right now? Have something coming up? You're not sure how it's going to work? Is my life going to happen this way? Is this going to work out? How is it going to work out? How, we ask, just like Mary. <laughs> the angel says, I have good news. Mary says, I just have one question. How? You worry about anything in your present? Anything right now? Some are worried about their past. Some of us, some of you look to your past and say there's too much. I can't, I can't fix that and I don't know that God wants to. God is the one who has us. God is the one who's watching over us. God can handle you. He can handle you. And my point is, we need to relax. 
We need to relax. Let's read on. Verse 38. I love, by the way, I love, uh, and this is where our, our sermon will wind down. But after the angel tells Mary how all this is going to happen, he tells her what's happening with Elizabeth, and then look at Mary's response. Verse 38, Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Mary, is. she starts out afraid, and then she's questioning, and now she's bold. She says, you listen to me. Not quite like that. But uh, behold means listen. I'm a servant of the Lord. You tell him, do what he needs to do with me. I am his servant. What an amazing statement. Think about what Mary would get. What will she get from this assignment? Her assignment is to be the mother of the Savior of the world. No pressure, right? But here's her assignment. She will be ridiculed. Surely she received some ridicule because of her and Joseph not being married and her being pregnant. And she was innocent. Was it hard raising Jesus with the other siblings? Do you think one of his siblings ever said, Jesus never gets in trouble? When is Jesus going to get in trouble? Surely that happened, right? Her son, Jesus, of course, when he reaches, uh, he starts his ministry at the age of 30, he is ridiculed, he has a mixed reputation Some believe he's the Messiah. Some believe he's a heretic. At a young age of 33, he will be tortured and killed in a most shameful death on a cross. And after his resurrection, Mary will not see him again until heaven. That's her assignment. But look at her identity. Who are you? Who are we? When you think of who you are, we identify ourselves with our name, but that doesn't really tell who we are. Maybe our occupation. Maybe you're a student. Maybe you're an athlete. Maybe you're involved in something. We identify ourselves with these human things. Mary said, I'm a servant of God. And I tell you, there is no greater title we could wear. There is no greater thing we could identify with besides being the servant of God Almighty. And so we're going to sing a song this morning. And it just, it's a good old song. It reminds us what our life should be about. We live in a culture that is in a frenzy this week. Why? We have to get everything ready for this holiday. We have to get get all these presents. We have to get all these decorations. We have to get this food. We have to get everything planned. Where are we going? Who's doing this? Who's doing that? A servant of God. That's who you are. And that's all that really matters. If you have a need this morning, we'd love to help you. Uh, If we could lift you up to God in prayer, maybe there's a concern. Maybe you're worried about something. We'd love to help you with that. If you're here this morning and you've never given your life to Christ, you can't really say you're a servant of God because you've never become a Christian, never been saved. Let us help you with that if you come while we stand and sing. Live for Jesus, oh my brother, his desire. Give it.